Hello and welcome to Public Health in Action. My name is Michael Fitzgerald and I'm Editor-in-Chief of Harvard Public Health Magazine. I'll be your moderator today. Public Health in Action is a new series from the Harvard Chan Studio and Harvard Public Health Magazine spotlighting public health programs that work. Today, in the first of our five-part series on mental health, we'll be talking about Fountain House, the first and largest example of a clubhouse organized by and for people with serious mental illness. Joining me today are Ida Mejia, who serves on the Fountain House Executive Committee and is also an MPH student at the City University of New York's Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy, Josh Seidman, Chief Research and Knowledge Officer at Fountain House, and Francesca Perniche, Associate Professor of Educational Psychology at Wayne State University. Ida, how did you first encounter Fountain House? Um, I first encountered Fountain House through a recommendation through my partial hospitalization program. And for those of us who've never been inside a, a clubhouse of this sort, can you describe what you might see when you go through the front door and, and what kind of work might be going on? Sure. Once you go through the front door, we have various units that help run the clubhouse. We have a unit of communications, which helps distribute information about what's going on in the clubhouse. We have a home and garden unit that focus on the beautification of the clubhouse, waters the plants. Um, we have a wellness unit, which focuses on providing services for members such as exercise and also healthy snacks, our culinary unit, which provides lunch for the clubhouse. But basically you're gonna see a very normalized environment where people are working together to run a clubhouse. And would you see the same people there more often than not when you're going in? I mean, you will definitely see regulars. Everybody comes in at whenever they want. It's very voluntary. Um, so there are some people that you will see every day, but there'll be people that you only see once a month or once a year. So it's very flexible. Very um, flexible. Francesca, so you've researched and written about the history of the clubhouse movement. Tell us about where the idea for clubhouses came from and, and how the role has evolved over time. Sure. Well, the modern day clubhouse has really evolved starting um, from its inception around 1948. But before then, uh, it really took a lot of its um, modeling after the emerging self-help groups that were coming out in uh, those years. Uh, 1944, this um, a group called We Are Not Alone, WANA, really established itself with allies from Rockland State Hospital. And uh, at the time, community psychiatrists and other um, professionals worked alongside um, former patients, we call them members of the clubhouse, uh, to really help them reintegrate what was life post-hospitalization. And so um, at its inception, um, Fountain House is really regarded as a pioneer in the community uh, mental health practice, really beginning to break down uh, much of what was traditionally known as top-down uh, care. And, and, I'll, and I'll just add that at the yeah. time, it was an entirely medical model. And so it was people living with serious mental illness who said, you know, that's not really working for us um, in terms of helping to contribute fully to our, our recovery and rehabilitation and said in, in what we would now use the language of address some of those social drivers of health. And, you know, frankly, they, they figured it out 75 years before the rest of us did. And, and did they call it a clubhouse kind of from the get-go or did that come later? Uh, I think it typically came later. The notion was sort of a social club. And, you know, if you think about uh, where it's located in New York City, really the mecca of the world in terms of coming to the U.S. And at the time, the club really uh, looked like a settlement house, if you will, or where folks um, would immigrate and there would be ethnic enclaves. So people sort of gathering and helping each other out to sort of make them uh, more successful in this country. Similarly, the club emerged as an intentional community that helped folks become successful once they left um, what was then a long-term hospitalization for psychiatric illnesses. Um, so it's sort of modeled after this notion of creating a community uh, for folks who had uh, similar experiences, um, looking for opportunities in, in, a, in a, a world where maybe 
friendships, families were no longer available to them after um, leaving such a long uh, term hospital uh, stay. And so this really, you know, 75 years later, um, what really grounds this model in the US and around the world uh, is a sense of community that Clubhouse brings to those um, seeking a place to be and belong. Let's talk some numbers. Josh, you, you lead research at Fountain House. What do we know about the medical and societal costs of serious mental illness and how does the Clubhouse model address them? Yeah, well, we know that clubhouses are very successful at helping people to uh, gain employment. So Fountain House has twice the level of employment as a comparable population. They have much higher educational attainment. We have, uh, we're able to help a lot of people who are unhoused to get housing. So 35 to 40 percent of our population has some history of homelessness. And we also know from a New York University study that we reduce Medicaid costs by 21% relative to the high-risk SMI population. So there's, a, there's a, a, a growing body of data around the effectiveness of this approach. Um, yeah, and the other thing we know is that we have um, benefits that go beyond just those costs in terms of the economic benefits. So we're actually going to be publishing a paper in the next couple of weeks that will basically builds this economic model that puts together all the mental health costs, physical health costs, along with disability costs, criminal justice costs, and employment or productivity costs. And when you add all that up, it's a difference of about $11,000. That is, it costs society about $11,000 less for the typical member compared to those who are not engaging in Clubhouse. And I want to stick with numbers for just a minute longer and ask, so so the, the cost reduction is impressive. I, I'm curious, where does it fit into our system of payments? Who, who pays for clubhouses? Yeah, that is tremendously variable. So um, it is something that uh, states have the authority through the Medicaid program to reimburse for, but many of them do not. So it is, uh, in some states, you do have a uh, system where they will pay for uh, either in 15 minute fee for service increments, like in Michigan, um, or uh, in Ohio, they'll pay on a per diem rate. Um, and then in some states, like New York State, they actually don't pay at all for clubhouse services. And so uh, in some places, like New York uh, City or in the state of Massachusetts, there are departments of health that actually set up contracts. And those provide uh, support. But what happens is that there are places where there is no reimbursement through any of those mechanisms. And in those places, there often are not, there's not an ability to sustain clubhouses. So I was mentioning New York City, where there's a, a city contract and there are 15 clubhouses operating in New York City. There are no clubhouses operating up, upstate, or <laughs> I should say, you know, north of, of the Bronx. Um, and so we see that that is tremendously determinative of at least the ability of clubhouses to uh, sustain themselves over time. So there's there's some they really kind of play out versus the sort of situation of of whatever state regulations are of, of different approaches to insurance uh, and, and reimbursement. Uh, so it's a complicated question if you're looking to set up a clubhouse of how you're going to make the model work. And right. yet, as and then there are, you know, there are countries that so there are clubhouses in 34 countries around the world. In a country like Norway, where they decided as a country to make an investment in clubhouses, there are 20 clubhouses for, uh, you know, a, a country of a little over 5 million people. And how many, in by comparison, are roughly in the U.S.? There are about 200 clubhouses operating in the United States. Yeah. So it's a it's a big big shift of a per capita basis. Um, I want to head back toward the 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 broader impact of treatment and care within well not treatment so much it's, but the care model of the, the clubhouses. And I wanted to touch base uh, touch, to, to sort of follow up on something Francesca you had mentioned in terms of when you've been hospitalized over a long period of time. Uh, there is there is a, a kind of sense of isolation that can uh, be developed. And in fact, you can lose contact with 
a lot of the people that you were connected with socially before you were hospitalized. And loneliness, we know, is being increasingly recognized as a risk factor for, for a host of, of the physical health problems. Uh, and I'm curious if we could look at the question of the, the way clubhouses try to foster social connection. Can it be an antidote for loneliness? And I thought uh, it would be great if you could sort of briefly talk about your experience with clubhouses and, and loneliness. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I had been to multiple programs before I actually was able to participate in Clubhouse. And for much of that time, I was isolated at home because it's really hard to relate to other individuals when you're in a situation where you can't work. And it's difficult to, you know, explain to people your same age, like what you're doing. It's like, oh, yeah, um, I'm not working right now. And it becomes a little bit awkward. But with the loneliness that comes with the clubhouse, I mean, um, loneliness that comes with mental uh, health issues, um, I think a lot of times people don't realize that with our current model, we treat symptoms. And with our clubhouse model, we're gaining back a lot of the things that we lost. So like, for example, um, you know, medication can't bring you friends. They can't bring back your family. They can't help you get a job. Um, you know, like, so having Fountain House um, really helped me come out with a lot of other individuals who were experiencing the same thing. And in that sense, I didn't have to talk about my personal issues. I didn't have to talk about, you know, my education or my job or anything like that. People just see you as a person. And that's like the first step, feeling comfortable with other individuals. And it tends to develop throughout time. You know, um, I didn't have like a bunch of friends when I first went to the clubhouse. But little by little, I started building a community and being part of a community. And, and Josh, have you been, thank you, Ina. Uh, Josh, have you been able to measure the impact of, of Fountain House's membership on a kind of a statistical, statistical basis, its impact on loneliness and isolation? Yeah, so we believe that it's really important to measure what the impact of services and supports for people with mental health issues is in quantitative terms. And to do that, you really need to use measures, patient reported outcome measures, as they're commonly called in, in the healthcare world, um, to measure what that experience is like. So we actually sat down with members with you know, a whole range of validated survey instruments. And together, we chose three of them. So we, we use the UCLA 3M loneliness scale as one of them. We also measure quality of life and we measure thriving because members said, we want to get at some of those aspirational issues um, in the measurement of people's experiences. And so through this um, measurement, we are now at the point where we are beginning to have uh, pre-post. So we're now doing it at the time of renewal as well at 12 month intervals. And we're finding that, you know, a fully a quarter of people who were lonely when they started are, are not lonely using this uh, scale uh, after 12 months. And so, um, you know, we're again, going to be publishing some data on this this spring. And I think, you know, it's really important because you put it in the context of What's going on? You know, the Surgeon Journal's uh, Surgeon General's report that came out last year on the epidemic of loneliness, and you know, we've seen the data that it's it's not only uh, tremendously important from the person's you know certainly their their lived experience. It's also important for their physical health. I mean, we know from research that loneliness is comparable to uh, smoking fifteen cigarettes a day in terms of physical health. Uh, complications. So this is this has big uh, physical uh, and economic in implications for our population as well. And we talked a bit about the the differences in ways that the clubhouse can be can be funded or reimbursed for. I, I'm curious, Francesca, if we we flip to the way that clubhouses are structured around the country, uh, including in your home state, Michigan, where I know you've done some, some uh, uh, in depth look at the way that clubhouses work there. Do they all follow the same script, the same setup, or do they have to sort of morph to meet unique needs? Well, um, the the clubhouse model has an outside accrediting body that maintains standards and fidelity, if you will, to sort of the structure and the oper operations of the model. Um, each area um, may customize in terms of like, uh, how their community and the resources in their community. So creating essentially uh, a system of care 
for community members that is part of the larger community. So say here in Michigan, we are pretty much a rural state um, aside from I'm in the metro Detroit area and then we have some larger cities on the west side of the state. Um, and so industries in those area, um, um, programs and agriculture, uh, different ways that the land use place can be integrated as finding meaningful and purposeful um, things. You know, essentially, this model came from something known as um, activity group therapy out of the very archaic uh, long term psychiatric um, units. And so even the word unit sort of has been uh, transcended into uh, wor a working community. One of the things I like to sort of position this is it's a place. It's a place where, you know, after 20 some years of really looking at this model that people come away with um, finding a sense of purpose and belonging and being with others who may have experienced similar things without necessarily, you know, sharing day to day, but seeing others whom you may identify with um, do things that um, bring them uh, happiness or satisfaction or sense of quality of life often propels us to sort of want to kind of um, try similar things. And so um, each, each, you know, if we look at different countries and different states, uh, accredited models like any type of accredited program um, meet certain standards, but each have flexibility to sort of um, operate as they do within their area or region, or virtually even. So, and I know you've been to um, and done uh, some work in Baltimore at a clubhouse there as well. And uh, how different was that from the the, the places that you saw uh, in the Detroit area or elsewhere where you you've uh, been in two clubhouses and studied them? Yeah, and and really the you know the size of a clubhouse can also create a different dynamic. But even small club clubhouses can really have um, interesting ways in which they interpret model standards to meet um, you know, essentially that everyone that is part of this community has the same opportunity to have the same kinds of um, positive outcomes, whether it be. Um, education, employment, stable housing, a network of friends and families. Um, essentially, we all want the same thing as um, one of um, the folks that we work with very closely at Fountain House used to say, we all want a, a, a nice and safe place to live. We all want a network of friends and family, and we all want something meaningful to do. And Aida, I, I know that uh, Josh, Josh had said there were 15 different uh, clubhouses in New York City. Uh, I'm curious about whether uh, if if you're in an environment like that, do you continue look and sort of shift around to different clubhouses uh, or is the uh, to, to find a model that sort of works better for you? Uh, how does that work from from the perspective of someone who's exploring like which fountain house to pick? Um, so, like I said, I was. Um referred to Fountain House. I have not been to the other clubhouses in New York because I found my community at Fountain House. Um, so I didn't really feel the need to go to other clubhouses. I, I would say that uh, Fountain House, which operates two clubhouses, one in Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan and one in the Bronx, um, they're, they're different environments. So, um, you know, their Fountain House Manhattan is much larger. And so, um, when you talk to a member, they will often say, hey, my name is, I'm from the home and garden unit, or, you know, my name is John, I'm from the communications unit, or whatever it might be. Um, whereas if you go to the Fountain House Bronx, they'll say, you know, my name is Stephen, I am from Fountain House Bronx, right? So it's a one community fail. And most of the clubhouses that I visit around the country are um, the either more the size of Fountain House Bronx or even smaller. And, and in those communities, it, it's a much more um, sort of one community feel. And so those kinds of things make a difference as well. So each, within a clubhouse that's large, you can have a different, you can have different kinds of communities. Sub-communities. And sub-communities, sub subgroups, like any larger group. Yeah. Is there an average size to, to the clubhouses, clubhouse communities, at least around the U.S.? 
Uh, you know, for m small to moderate size clubhouses, like I, I kind, we kind of look at what's the daily average attendance. And so most clubhouses that are small to moderate size probably aim between, you know, 35 to 40 members a day, whereas larger clubs like a Fountain House or we also have a Magnolia Clubhouse in Cleveland uh, that's like a similar to a Fountain House size. Uh, St. Louis also has a large clubhouse. They may get upwards to over 100 members daily. Yeah. And, and Fountain House actually is about 350 every day, but um, but that's of an active membership, active. usually about 30% or so on average are coming on an average day. So, um, you know, if it's a mem if, if you're seeing, you know, 30, 50 people, you might have a, a membership of 100, 150 active members. And that means that they're coming in at least once a quarter. And we talked a bit about some of the numbers around the U.S. that there are approximately 200 or so programs. Uh, I'm curious about, you know, given the the impact that it, it is able to have that you've talked about in in some of the research you've done, the the impact that I just talked about in terms of it having on on her life and on the lives of people in in, in her her community, like would what are the obstacles that uh, that like prevent, say, the per capita use of uh, the per capita size of clubhouses or number of sub club clubhouses in the U.S. from being, I don't know, something similar to what they are, say, in Norway or other places. You want to take that? We sometimes one? joke that uh, you know, our, the, our having being a not-for-profit organization and community-based organization whose tagline is, you know, the best kept secret, um, isn't necessarily a good thing, right? So. Part of it is there's just a, a not great awareness. I mean, I hear stories all the time of people, even in New York City, who uh, have never heard of Fountain House, um, who have people, uh, loved ones who are in need of this kind of support. So, you know, that's that's something that we're working very hard to change. Um, I think that there also is, um, and, and we have done a lot of outreach uh, with uh, psychiatry programs, with uh, other behavioral health organizations with large health systems trying to build that and we even have a curriculum uh, now that we've developed that actually helps uh, to provide some some guidance around how to work with clubhouses and it's called partners in care yes and, and we challenges payments yeah the payment model yes Sorry. go ahead I think you were... oh yeah um i was going to mention about our recharge station that we have in times square which helps do active reach out to individuals who are experiencing um, homelessness. So through meeting people where they're at and through trust building is how we, we plan on like helping people get to Clubhouse and utilize the um, all the services that we have to offer, which include housing services. Um, and Francesca, the, the, is the research base that we've talked about, is it broad enough to, is it broad enough to sort of be convincing for for states or places where they 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 may have some interest in this, but they they want to see more data. Where are we in terms of of the documentation, the evidence for how well it works? Uh, well, the evidence uh, is there. Um, you know, uh, NIMH uh, commissioned a study in the late '70s, early '80s, and then again in the late '90s in terms of looking at uh, the effectiveness of this model. So we have the early evidence that was um, done with systematic kinds of studies. We have ongoing sort of uh, qualitative as well as phenomenological evidence that sort of drives an understanding of what are the mechanisms that attract people to this community, keep them coming back, and also um, having them meet and reach their goals. Um, states are looking, I just had a conversation about last week, another state is interested in the model. Um, you know, how, how is it, uh, how are they able to sort of replicate this in various areas? Our state has primarily funded this model through, um, Medicaid. We are now beginning to look at opening up the doors beyond, uh, uh that type of reimbursement, which will begin, um, folks that are underinsured or may not have uh, options to go to a clubhouse because they have a private uh, insurance or uh, some other um, form of public insurance. So 
it's it's really an, an interesting opportunity to look at the benefits uh, this adds to other medically based treatments. Not to say that this doesn't have um, a component of it that is grounded still in um, health and wellness, um, but it also uh, what differentiates this model is the environment that the clubhouses um, create. It's a dynamic. Um, it's, it's sort of uh, the folks, uh, we call them social practitioners as well, members and staff and social practitioners operating to create a environment that is inviting, um, that is uh, helps increase individual self-efficacy, uh, opportunities, choice, empowerment. Um, it's really a partnership model, uh, which is how much of a how much of a challenge is that? In in uh, I guess if you look at the way that we respond, at least in the U.S., to a number of kinds of of health issues, it's a crisis response. Uh, and so, how does that play in toward what sounds like a a, a program that's really dedicated dedicated to prevention and then the longer term recovery than we would typically see in our crisis response. I mean, in terms of a, I mean, it, it's still, you know, folks living with serious mental illness um, continue to live in isolation, continue to be over, overrepresented in a number of um, areas such as homelessness and being at the wrong place at the wrong time. So crisis may sort of continue? How does the model respond uh, to living crisis, essentially? Um, over time, uh, folks tend to have less, less psychiatric crises when they're part of this model. Um, but the real key is, is how does the model integrate itself into the community to work with other organizations to really address, like Josh was saying, the social determinants of overall health? And so, you know, when someone loses their home or hasn't a place to live, which, you know, having a stable place to live is really a significant component of just stable mental health or recovery, if you will. Um, and so it is really oriented to both in terms of um, being readily available to coordinate with your community resources, as well as folks within the clubhouse that are knowledgeable around, whether it be a, a social practitioner or another member. Um, and so from, from doing a significant amount of research, I can speak from that end, but there might be other ways, um, Josh or Ida, that you might have ex you know described this model as also not only preventative, but really addressing the here and now. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, at Fountain House, uh, we have a really like holistic approach to mental health. So not only are we focusing on housing, but we're also focusing on other um, opportunities such as employment and education. Um, we also have care managers that help coordinate our, our care. And like you mentioned, social practitioners, which help with obtaining benefits. And once again, as you mentioned, having members that can support us in that same process as well. Yeah, and, and I would just add that, you know, when we're talking about the engagement of members, you know, one of the potential mechanisms, mechanisms of action, if you will, is trust, um, you know, that for very good reason, many, many people with serious mental illness uh, do not have a lot of trust in the healthcare system. And when you establish that trust, it changes how they engage. And so, I mentioned that study from NYU that found that there was a 21% reduction in overall costs um, for people compared to people in the high-risk SMI population. That actually masks some differences. There's actually a 35 to 45% reduction in hospitalizations and ER visits, which is slightly compensated for by increased primary care visits, increased outpatient mental health visits, and increased pharmacy. We see better adherence to medication. And so what we're seeing is a real shift in how people are engaging with the other parts of the healthcare support system. This has been a fascinating conversation and, and I know there's a lot more we could unpack with this, but I, our time for today, I think is, is up. I wanna thank you all so much for being here with us, for sharing with us your observations, research, 
for this thoughtful discussion that we've had. And for the audience, I'd like to say, please join us again for our next conversation in public health in action, when we'll talk about how the Working on Womanhood program is reducing post-traumatic stress disorder in teenage girls.